Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> Pray for that man. <laughs> if you could turn please to the book of Ezekiel then, chapter 47. I was tempted this morning when um, David talked about Ezekiel 37 because that's one of my favorites. I was going to change the message, but... <laughs> We'll stay with this. Although it's in line with Ezekiel, everything. The scripture, you know, the, the scripture is one. You know, there isn't some one part that's different, another part. When we come to the Word of God, it's, it all connects somewhere. So, so we, I cannot take a, a passage in isolation because we need to have the whole counsel of God. So I can't say, well, Ezekiel 37 has got nothing to do with Ezekiel 47. It has everything to do with Ezekiel 47. Can you see what I'm saying? Um, so it's Ezekiel chapter 47. Um, well, thank you for asking me again. I think you're very long-suffering. But I'm, I'm, glad, to, I'm glad to be here. Um, Ezekiel 47, okay, you're all there. Well, when I was preparing this message, I was, the, the, things, the things that God works on my heart are the only things that I, can, that I can actually deliver. I don't have messages that I've got from Spurgeon or somebody more eloquent than myself that I can actually deliver. Um, somebody sent me a message the other day from A.W. Tozer, who's one of my favorite uh, speakers. I can't repeat that message because I'm not A.W. Tozer. I remember when I was young, I was really into toes, and he was like, really strong on a lot of things. And, uh, and uh, people used to say to him, why do you always quote Tozer? He says, why don't you quote Jesus? I said, well, I said, when they get to heaven, I said, you know, Jesus will look at me, he'll be merciful. Tozer will look at me and say, how did you get here? <laughs> you know, sometimes we have these things that they weigh upon us. And when you're young, you like this zeal. You, You've got this enthusiasm, you're striving to get to this place and you want these guys to motivate you. But I understand that when I was younger, I didn't quite understand where Tozer was coming from. Because I come from a Catholic background, I thought he was trying to whip me into something. He wasn't. Tozer was actually very big on grace. But when I was younger in the Lord, I didn't understand grace like I understand grace now. And hopefully, as I go along, I'll understand grace even more. Because grace is what leads you to glory. You cannot get to glory without grace. You cannot get to glory by striving. I think it was uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards that said, grace is but glory begun. Glory is but grace perfected. You know, we begin by grace, we end by grace. Outside of grace, there is no walk with God. And, and the, the problem nowadays, or the problem that's coming to the church is we're trying to correct what has gone wrong. And what has gone wrong simply is as a result of us not grasping and laying hold of God ourselves. We've relied on teachers, we've relied on systems, we've relied on works, you know, reaching the world, saving the lost, good works. They're all good and they're all necessary, but they've replaced the need to walk with God. The Apostle Paul was saying, you know, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformable unto his death. Paul had only one goal in mind and that was Jesus. When he, when he came to the church, he says, I travail that Christ might be formed in you. He wasn't trying to whip them up to do something. He was trying to preach the word, but at the preaching of the word and the receiving of the word, the deliverance comes. It doesn't come by self-effort, by striving. And so this, uh, this, this, this passage that I'm looking at today is something that's dear to my heart. And if I had to title the message, it would be, Can These Bones Live? Can These Bones Live? I remember... I, I spoke this message, the reason it's close to my heart, that years ago, I think it was, I can't remember now, I was over in India and I'd, uh, 
I'd taken some money from the church in America to give to the pastors, and uh, I think there were about five pastors, and he wanted the money spread out evenly. And I've told this story before, so if you've heard it, you can go to sleep. Um, and, uh, and I'd got the money, I'd, and, I'd, and I also wanted to buy them a fax machine, because the church needed a fax machine. So I'd, the fax machine cost 100 pounds, so I bought the fax machine, and I started dividing the money between the others. And I went to, this, went to the pastor and go, I went to the other pastor somewhere else. And then that Saturday night I had to preach in the morning and I was waiting on the Lord and I wasn't getting anything. And this was strange, I thought, there's something stuck, something's wrong. And uh, so I cried out to the Lord, I said, what's going on? And he pointed out this hundred pounds that I'd spent on the fax machine was not what the church in America had given me the money for. They gave me the money to give to the pastors. You have to, you have to be a good steward of what God has given you. So I just repented before God. I said, okay, I'll sort it out. Because <laughs> I would have bought them a fax machine myself anyway. And, uh, and I got right before God, and I said I was wrong, I repented. And then he gave me this message. Son of man, can these bones live? You know, you're in a position where everything's hopeless. Everything looks like it's all over. And the word of the Lord comes and says, can this morning say, Mr. Lord, you know. You know, so let's, let's go to the passage. Did I say, do you know, you, you confuse me. He said, I, I, it's actually Ezekiel 37. 47 is about, uh, is about the river. See, I'm so stuck with that river, I can't get away from it. In fact, you're sorry, for those of you who've been suffering me, it's actually Ezekiel chapter 37 and Ezekiel 47. Those are my two favorite passages in Ezekiel, along with Ezekiel 36 and along with everything else. It's, it's, it's a great book. Ezekiel chapter 37. And the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. That's worth a hallelujah. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I, as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus said the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost, and we are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of them, come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord, and I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord, and that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, said the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? That the situation is hopeless. They're not just dead, they're dry. <laughs> and and sometimes in our experience, we, we come into these places because we're looking at something that is without hope. Whatever, it might be a personal situation, 
but very often it's linked into our it's linked into our walk with the Lord. We've come to a place where we're stuck. You know, we know what the promises of God says. We know what is promised, and yet we're living in this. It must be for other people. They can't be for me. All the promises of God are yes and amen, amen. to everyone. Because for every one of us in this room this morning, he has paid the same price. There wasn't a greater price or a lesser price paid for me than it was for you. And that price pays for everything. And if our confidence is in my effort or in my, maybe I'm not trying hard enough, then I get even drier and I get even harder. My confidence must be in what God has declared. My confidence must be in what God has provided. He has provided the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is an eternal power. He says the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Redemption was not plan B. You know, man fell and God said, oh dear, what am I going to do? I better send my son to die. No. From the foundation of the world, God had in mind. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the Alpha he is the Omega, He is the beginning, and He is the end. We're the ones that are lost in time. And He has brought us into this place called eternity. Eternity has no beginning, it has no end. I can go back to 37 years ago, August the 17th, 1984, and He said, that's when I got saved. Well, that's when I experienced salvation. That's when I came into the knowledge of the living God, because He was gracious to me. It's when I met with Jesus. It was something that changed my life. And so I, I tend to look at that day, but from God's point of view, those 31 years that I wasted in the wilderness, doing my own thing, being an ego in my, you know, being a legend in my own lunchtime, God's gift to the world, except the world wasn't ready for me. Um, and I'm ashamed of it because sometimes people give their testimony and they tell you what they used to do. I don't really, I'm too ashamed to talk about it. I'm too ashamed to glorify those things. But God, in his economy, he's not cance just cancelled those things out. He's brought me into a place where I can, I'm working with, with a group of people right now in, in my job. And I can look at those people and say, had God not saved me, I would be with those people. I work in a, uh, I work in a hospital for people that have got mental health problems. Uh, they're criminals as well. So that's where I would have been. And so I don't, these are the kind of people that I would have despised. I would have despised them even as a Christian. I'm sorry to say, but that's, but God has been working this grace in my life where I understand that but for the grace of God. Amen. And so I'm working with people and says, well, can these bones live? <laughs> There's no chance. And, it's, and I think what I used, to, I used to see unbelievers before is people that either need to get saved or they go to hell. I never saw them as people. I never saw, I never saw that they were made in the image of God. And God has worked that thing in me. It's almost Paul's looking at me saying, when, when do you actually get saved? <laughs> Paul knows me well because... He, he knows all my faults, and, that, and I'm open about it. But there are things that, even now, we're coming into more and more areas of revelation where we understand that we're not what we think we are. You know, we, we tend to put our confidence in our doctrine. We put our confidence in, uh, I thank you, I'm not like these others. We might not say it because it's not a good thing to say, but in our hearts, you know, when this uh, lockdown thing happened and Christians were kind of, on different camps about whether they take the vaccine or they don't take the vaccine. And everyone was getting some righteousness out of it. You know, whichever camp it was, I, I, I don't belong to camps. So I thought, well, you need to look at God, you need to let other people be who they are. And you need to love people where they're at. Now I'm saying this as somebody that never did that, okay? For 20 years I was, my, my Christian life was really around my ego. I didn't know it, but, <laughs> When God starts breaking things down in you. And the other thing I didn't realize, those 31 years of messing around or whatever, had brought a lot of brokenness into my life. 
And, and I remember talking to someone who was always going on about healing. And he said, I said, why do you go on about healing so much? I said, you know, there's an overemphasis on healing. Why, why, don't, why don't you talk about holiness? And he looked at me and says, you don't realize just how much you're broken into and how much you need healing. Yeah. And I thought, ah. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, all things have passed away, all things have become new. But he was right. There are traits in me that come out that the Spirit of God, I've not allowed the Spirit of God to touch. This, this, this right to myself, what I think. No, I can justify all my actions by Scripture. But I... I can know the scripture that well that I don't actually need God anymore. You know, so we live this. Adam fell because of his independence from God. Our problem in the church today is not sin. Sin has been dealt with. Our problem is that we want to be in charge. It's flesh. Flesh will always resist the Spirit, and it will justify why we don't need the Spirit of God in our lives. Unfortunately, today, when we talk, when we talk about Spirit, people think about the charismatic movement and they think about all the, all the weird and wonderful things. I'm talking about the Spirit of God being essential in your life on a day-to-day -day basis. If you can live without the Spirit of God in your life, you're living a life, you're still justified by faith, you still have peace with God. God is not going to cast you away. He's not going to, you're not a second-class Christian. But you're missing out on the things that God can do in spite of you. Yeah? Because Ezekiel, high was spiritually was, was looking at his dry bones. There was nothing he could do as a prophet. His prayer life was not up. It was not up to the mark. My prayer life is not up to the mark. And I need God sometimes to come in and say, look at the situation, look, look how desperate it is. You can talk about healing, you can talk about whatever situation in your life. And what we do when we come to these situations, we look at the scripture and we try to work the scripture into prayer, work the prayer into scripture, trying to make things happen. That's, that's our Western mind. It's, we need to have techniques. We need to have, we need to have something we can lay hold on. But like David was saying this, this morning, the river in Ezekiel, as it goes deeper and deeper, so you have less and less control. So you're taken and you're moved by the Spirit of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I can, a, a lot of the problems that has happened in the West is because people have been very strong about their doctrines, very strong about what they believe. And so it is okay to isolate themselves from other people. It's okay to kill Catholics. It's okay to do all kinds of things. We have justified wars, you know, we have justified slavery, we've justified a whole lot of things through biblical rationale. There was nothing wrong with the biblical rationale, it's just that we used it for our own benefit. Now, whatever the Spirit of God reveals to us must be in line with Scripture. You know, it must be line upon line, precept upon precept. But it, the Spirit of God must be the instigator Otherwise, there's no deliverance. We're still trying. We're still saying, why isn't this happening? And then we go for advice. Can you pray about this? We ring everybody to pray. And everyone's praying in their own sweet way, you know? Uh, I've heard people pray, and it's like, okay, we could pray for someone. Okay. I'm the victim, okay? I say, I say to Mary, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really ill. Can you pray for me? She says, what's wrong with you? I said, well, it's this pain I've got in my chest. I don't know what it is. It's okay, we'll pray about it. So she goes to a prayer meeting and says, oh, can we pray for Dominic because his pain is just, what's it about? Well, I don't know. So David pipes up, says, well, it could be cancer. She, uh, and somebody else pops up, it could be a heart attack, you know. And then, so we're all praying for me. We're all praying, you haven't got one mind because the mind of the Lord has not been revealed. Okay? So we need to pray in line with the, in line with, with the, with the will of God. And, the, and like Ezekiel says, you know. Can these bones live? I don't know. You know. Can this person get healed? I don't know. You know. But then he gives you a strategy. Okay? He says to Ezekiel, prophesy. This is what I want you to do. 
He says to Jeremiah, this is what I want you to do. He says to Ezekiel, this is what I want you to do. They had a strategy. Isaiah came into the presence of God and he says, Woe is me, for I'm undone. For my eyes have seen the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Until he has a vision of God, he's full of his own righteousness. And this is the problem with the church. Again, the problem with the church is not sin so much as our own righteousness. It, and we need, to, we need to find, we need to have a breakthrough with this. And that breakthrough only comes from the Spirit of God when he reveals to you. My problem for the last, for 20 years was my own righteousness. But God used me, yes. People, yeah. But just because God is using me doesn't mean that I'm fit for the kingdom of God, you know. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, heaven be prophesied in thy name, in thy name cast out devils, in thy name there are many wonderful works. And he said, I never knew you. So I don't look to these ministries anymore. I don't look to, I'm looking to see if I'm in line with the will of God. The job that I'm in now, I would never do in a hundred years if you asked me before, because it's not a ministry. You know. Ministry's got a lot of ego attached to it. You know, so, oh, you know, oh I, I feel the poor, oh, you know, I've got this Bible ministry, I've got this on, whatever it is. But it's, it's something that, that we can boast about. Uh, we, we had this, in Reto, it was a very big thing. Reto was people, extra addicts who came to Reto, and Reto, your whole life was basically involved with the work, you know, trying to reach people. So we are full time, we are, you know, these church people, the only, there was like a despising of people who weren't full time. But what it was, it was just full time ego. <laughs> I mean, God, you, don't get me wrong, God, God did a lot of things in Reto, he used a lot of people, but, but I realized God is not looking at what you do. He's looking at what you allow him to do. Because he can do exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. The power that's at work within us is the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. We're talking about resurrection power. We're talking about ascension power. We're talking about a power that transcends anything we can do. And we need to connect. And the reason we don't connect, like I said before, it's not because of sin. Sin is easy. You know, if you sin, you confess your sins. It's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you for all unrighteousness. If any man says he has no sin, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him, so I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about your right to yourself, my right to myself. I'm talking about flesh. The old man has been crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. Sin is this right to yourself. That's what it is. And we look at the bad things. You know, when, you look at, uh, when you look at the epistles, and it talks about the deeds of the flesh. We would call them sins, you know, adultery. But these are, these are the result of flesh. The unbeliever doesn't have flesh. He's just sin. That's, that's all he is. But those of us who have been born again, we have this conflict of the flesh and the spirit. And it's always channeling us. And like I said, the problem isn't sin, because if I sin, I know I've done wrong. But when I think I'm right, that's when my prayer life gets hindered. Because God had no problem with the sinners. Jesus had no problem with the sinners. The problem he had was with the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't get answered to prayer. The Pharisees couldn't see the Messiah when he was looking at them in the face. They couldn't recognize the work of the Messiah in fact, they thought, he's raised Lazarus from the dead. This is not good for us. Let's kill him. Let's kill Lazarus. You know, signs and wonders don't impress people. The evil heart of unbelief can only be changed by the Spirit of God. So it says, can these bones live? The thing that you can't believe right now, is it possible for God to give you faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We cannot manufacture faith by using the scripture and manipulating God. We need the revelation of scripture that breaks. There's the word, it says, that divides asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Again, another error that's come to the church, in my view it's an error, is this understanding of soul and spirit. People say, well, the soul and the spirit are the same thing. Well, it, and these are the people who also believe that the, 
the Holy Spirit and the apostles and all that kind of stuff, it all finished. And so now we've got very clever theologians teaching us how to be in bondage. Uh, because the whole, the whole idea of preaching, the whole idea of ministry is to empower people to do the work of the ministry. This morning, the, the Word of God is not about was that a good sermon or not. Has God put something into your heart, has God put something into your spirit, into your minds that will empower you, that will equip you for, your, for tomorrow or for today? Or is it just another sermon that when you get in the car, you think, God, that was a waste of time. Uh, it doesn't matter. But the idea of preaching is to empower people. That something comes. You might not like it. I, I don't think that when Jesus was preaching, people ever liked anything he said. But they were, his words were spirit and they were life. And if you don't connect with spirit and life, then you cannot impart spirit and life. And so, so it has to do with our daily walk. It has to do with how much time. What's important in my life? How much time do I give to God? Compared to how much time I give to myself. And that self can be ministry, okay? That self can be anything. Being useful to other people. I learned a long time ago that I'm no good to people. Uh, God is the only one that's any good to anyone. But, I, but your ego will tell you people need you. So I have my phone on, like, you know, people ring me all out. But none of them ever changed. They just want someone to listen to their problems. They don't want to change. So I turned my phone off at a certain time, and I think, you know, Jesus didn't have a phone. Uh, <laughs> he didn't have the internet. I don't know how the apostles ever managed, poor guys. You know. We're so equipped today, they were completely useless to the kingdom of God. We know so much. We've got all the books, we've got all the knowledge, and we cannot move. We cannot deliver one person, never mind ourselves. And so this is the time, I think, you know, everything that's happened in the last year, in, that God is actually speaking to his church to rise up. And when I say church, I don't mean, come on, let's save the world. I mean you, I mean me. I mean the church is every one of us. To be brought into the things that God has saved you for. Primarily, to be conformed to the image of his son. And then the ministry flows from there, from that. You know, I've, in this place I work, I've, I've seen the work that God has done is done in my heart more than he's done in anyone else. I don't see things happen for other people. They just think I'm strange because I'm not like them. And that's the staff. Uh, but I, I, was, I was talking to you the other week about this particular client I've got. Well, God has put, put that on my heart because he's probably the most hopeless case that I've ever worked with. You know, not only has he got all these physical and mental and all these problems, he even lost his sight. And, you know, that was... But, the other day, I took him to Manchester Eye Hospital. He had a cataract operation, and he can see. You know, that's, that's a measure of something. And, I, and it was like salvation to me. I could see where he was at, you know. I take his cup, and he sees the cup, and he grabs it, and he drinks. But to me, that's something God has done. The hospitals didn't want to touch him because it's too much of a risk. Something might go wrong and nobody wants to take the blame. I can't say I prayed and asked God. I don't think I did. But God, but God is working with me because he knows that I need encouragement. It has nothing to do with my ego anymore. It has nothing to do, it has to do with God blessing other people and things changing and your whole focus being, I, I actually don't know. I know this Bible probably better than most people. But when it comes to situations now, I realize I don't know. And I have to seek the Lord. I can't just assume that because God did it back in 1986, he'll do it, and he'll do it today. I don't know. Every battle has its own strategy. The battle for Jericho and the battle for AI, or IE, whichever one you call it, were different. God gives you strategies. And, and this is what it means to walk with God. It means you know, his, you know you're walking in His will. It's not, something, um, it's not something that you assume because you know the Scripture. And, and this thing about the Western church is we don't have this dependency on Him anymore. We've lost that. 
We've taken pride, oh, we're a Christian country, whatever that means. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not Catholic, we're not Protestant, we're evangelical, we're, we believe in the gifts, we don't believe. We've got this thing that gives us a righteousness other than what God has given us. You know, we are still sinners, saved by grace. But we've been brought into sonship. So God's love for you is constant. It never fails in spite of you. And when you're convinced that you're loved, you don't have to stop playing these games to impress people. You know the child that doesn't know it's loved? It's such a nuisance. It's always up there trying to get attention. You know, I had this for 20 years. I, I didn't really know I was loved. And the first time I knew I was loved, I'd blown it big time. And God disciplined me. And through that discipline, I really knew he loved me. Because he loves those. He, those he loves, he disciplines. I never really knew the discipline of the Lord because I hadn't really messed up that big. Well, not in my mind. <laughs> but, but I knew it messed up. And God disciplined me. And I'm thankful for it because I know, I, know, I know now that however much I mess up, he'll still love me. It's not based upon me anymore. It's based on the love of God. That, again, is eternal. He loved me before he saved me. He loved me and he washed me in his own blood. He didn't wash me and then love me. He washed you because he loved you. And the blood of Jesus is a continual entrance into the dimensions of the Holy Spirit. The reason we can have access to the Holy Spirit is because blood was shed. We were brought into sonship. And, and the Spirit within us witnesses that we are sons of God. If you're not saved, you won't know what I'm talking about. I'll tell Rhett that I should talk to, talk to the guys, like all the guys who are saved. I, think, yeah, yeah. I should go to the guys who weren't saved. I said, did you understand any of that? I said, no. I said, good, that proves you're not saved. Because the ministry is to the church. Okay? What we're doing, we're trying to get unbelievers regenerated. We can't do that. But we need to provoke them to jealousy. We need to have something that they want. We need to provoke the Jews to jealousy. There has to be something that they want. You know, there's, God has given us something that belongs to the Jew first. Yeah? And so we're, we're going wrong and we're, I don't know. I'm thankful for this time that God has sort of cut off church for a bit. That we can all, that God gives us the time to seek him individually, to find out what we're really about. Because if church never came back, what would we do? Okay? We're not dependent on church. We're dependent on the one who holds us, the one who keeps us. And if everyone has this confidence, then we can minister to each other with confidence. You know, we're not looking for what do you think or what do you believe. We're looking to love one another with the love of God. Because that love is constant. I, I don't love people, I know that. I'm too self-centered and egocentered to love anybody. But God does things in my life in spite of me. You know, and if he can do it with me, he can do it with anyone. So I want to encourage you this morning to draw near to God. Call upon his name. Or whatever situation that you're stuck in, say, Lord, I don't know, but you know. Call upon his name. He will give you the strategy. You might not be what you're comfortable with, uh, but he will not fail you. Okay, God bless you.